Okay, well, I'm going to talk about uh, what's special about hypersonic flight, what's different to hypersonic flight than flight at any other flight regime, and where do you do hypersonic flight? Why would you? Why would you travel so fast in the atmosphere where you get very hot and there's lots of friction around? Well, hypersonic flight, by implication, you have to be in an atmosphere. Out in space, you go very fast, but you don't really call it hypersonic flight unless you're in, a, in an atmosphere. And going very fast, there are a lot of aerodynamic effects like uh, lift, drag, heat transfer. They can be useful to you and they can be a disadvantage. We'll, we'll look first about where do you fly and what sort of things do you do when you fly. Uh, depending on what your mission is, that has a, a strong influence on the, the shape and the design of the flight vehicle you use. We can categorize certain commonly used uh, flight paths. The most well known is the re-entry corridor when you come back from outer space and you it's a good idea to stop before you hit the ground because you're <laughs> traveling very fast. The, the cruise corridor, that's when you want to travel at a constant speed and just travel places fast. The cruise corridor actually hardly exists at the moment because we don't know how to do it in a sustained manner. An acceleration corridor relates to when you're trying to accelerate to go through the hypersonic flight regime and get into space. Again, it's not something we do particularly at the moment because we don't have the propulsion systems to facilitate it. And then there's more likely the common things is suborbital space hops, where you want to shoot something up very fast, get out of the atmosphere, and then come back in again at a, some distant location and travel very fast as you do it. What you might think of a hypersonic flight trajectory actually isn't. The normal way of getting into space is not to fly hypersonically. You need to go at speeds in space that are much faster than hypersonic, but actually you try and do that acceleration outside the atmosphere. So the space shuttle, for instance, although it'll have a nominal Mach number of 25 when it's in space, very hypersonic, it leaves the atmosphere by about, by about Mach 3. It goes straight up and out of the atmosphere as quickly as it is. You, it can, because it's not a good place to be when you're traveling very fast in an atmosphere. Lots of drag, lots of heat transfer, you're likely to burn up and self-destruct. Well, we've been using re-entry corridors for about 60 years since the first missiles went up into space. Uh, the main function of a re-entry corridor is just to lose speed. And uh, in doing that, if you want to survive, you've got to control your drag, your deceleration. You can easily be destroyed just through too many g-forces and also the heat transfer. Lots of energy around which can burn you up if you're not careful. There are, there are several categories of ballistic trajectory. The ones we're going to look at here is the so-called ballistic trajectories where we have only drag and no lift. Most flight trajectories will actually make use of lift to a certain amount, like the Apollo coming in had a lifting trajectory. Uh, but the ballistic trajectories are very good because you can get analytical solutions for them and we often use a ballistic trajectory as a starting point for a design study because you can get quite close to what a flight path might really be and you can get analytical solutions, which is a good thing to have at the start of a design process. You know roughly where you're flying, which is how high, uh, and I guess which atmosphere you're in and how fast you're going. And then you can have a stab at designing a vehicle. So ballistic Entry it relates to using drag forces to slow yourself down. There are three basic categories within a ballistic trajectory. Air capture has not actually been done yet, but we talk about it a lot. And uh, that, that relates to coming in from a outside, outside of uh, Earth on a, a so-called hyperbolic trajectory, outside of gravity's influence, and you have to slow down enough in the atmosphere to, to get captured, but not actually to land. Uh, Aero braking may, can be used to adjust a capture orbit by, by ducking down the atmosphere for a little while and losing some velocity and then going out again. You might wonder why would you do that? Well, if you want to change your orbit and you don't use braking, you have to fire up rockets and rockets are heavy and they have to carry fuel. So it's a way of losing your speed without having a propulsion system to do it. And the most commonly used trajectory course is a total re-entry where you come in from outside and you stop and you adjust things to get the right control of velocity along the way through the atmosphere. Okay, well, what sort of vehicle would we like to build for re-entry? You know, traditional aerodynamicists like to make things that look nice and sleek and sort of sexy, and it turned out, you know, they don't work very well for re-entry purposes because the purpose isn't to generate lift and to fly long distances with minimum amount of fuel, it's to stop. So. Typically, re-entry vehicles are characterized by surfaces aligned normally to the flow, so the force that acts on them is pushing against your direction of motion. So in any form, field of engineering, a good uh, 
idea as a starting point when you go into a new application is to look at what people did before and see if it's going to work. If you don't do that, you're likely to reinvent the wheel. So when we first had the capability to go hypersonically in the 50s, we looked at what's a traditional aerodynamic shape, and it's like you see on the left there. It's something long and slender looking. And they analyzed that, they tested in wind tunnels, and it really didn't work very well. You can imagine if you use that long skinny thing as a brake, the main surfaces you have for braking are friction surfaces. It's like trying to slide down a rope. You rub all the skin off your hands through friction. And that's not the way to go. So a big breakthrough came in the 50s when they decided you don't make long slender things, you make blunt bodies. And that's been the way we've done it ever since. And it's sort of self-evident what you do. It's blunt, it pushes the air out of the way, slows you down, and the heat transfer is minimized. Even if you look at something that's quite streamlined, like the space shuttle, on re-entry it flies more like a brick. It comes in at like 40 degrees to the flight path and most of the surfaces are pointing forwards. Obviously it generates some lift as well, which we're not going to analyse in this course. But uh, it's a blunt body dissipating heat. You see the same vehicle later when it comes into land, it flies in a very different mode. Here is an example of a flight vehicle coming through the atmosphere. Uh, all the energy is being dissipated, there's radiation in the shock layer, you can see it glowing, and when it, when it lands and people come out, hopefully they survived, it's, you can see it's a very simple blunt body shape, it doesn't really look sophisticated, but actually technically it's a very advanced design, getting people back from space alive and safe is not easy. This is a classic design called the sphere cone configuration, shown here in a, a, a Titan entry capsule. You want to make the thing as blunt as you can because that's the most efficient shape. Of course, if you make it blunt, you introduce another problem. All your drag forces are on the front because your mass has to be behind the front surface. So it's effectively unstable as if you try and balance something with all its weight beyond the point of support. Uh, you see those front surfaces are flared back a bit and uh, that by flaring them back, you reduce their efficiency as an air brake a little bit, but you're moving the center of drag further downstream so it's easier to handle the stability. So that's the classic shape we use for re-entry into the Earth or other planets at high speeds as well. Okay, we'll look now at getting, doing some simple sums as to find out if you're doing a re-entry, where you're going to be at, say, 50 kilometers altitude, how fast will you be going? That's a fundamental equation you use. So the first starting point is to use what we call a flat Earth trajectory, where you ignore the curvature of the Earth. Seems to work very well in Queensland. And it gives you a very good starting point for um, analysis. So, so equations are very simple, you have drag, because there's no lift, it's back in the direction you're flying, you've got a velocity vector, and you've got gravity pulling from one side. And the important parameters are how high are you, what angle are you flying, uh, and how fast are you going. So we can write down some basic equations. We have these in more detail in the associated uh, documents. Uh, very simple, it's a dv by dt term, which is your deceleration. There's a dy by dt, that's how fast you're falling vertically through the sky, which is just a, a function of what angle you're flying at and how fast you're going, simple geometry. Then, of course, you've got to bring your mass into it, so the mass times the deceleration gives you the forces. That relates to drag and gravity. Uh, your angle will be changing as you, as you fly through the sky. As you change your direction, you have to rotate a velocity vector. So transverse force is needed normal to your flight to keep rotating the velocity vector. And in fact, we'll, we'll ignore this second term in a minute. Okay, typically, you, if it's hypersonic flight, it's, it's a big number. Your velocity is big, and these terms all scale with velocity squared. So velocity squared is pretty close to infinity. So if your feature is small, you can see from the equations that the feature by dy will be small as well. So why not, as a starting point, ignore any changes in angle as you fly and pretend it's a straight line flight path. It's, you know, don't go and fly on the stuff I'm going to teach you, you'll kill yourself, but use it as a starting point to get your first design ready and when you have a spacecraft that might be close to being usable, then you go and do the sums properly through computational techniques. But you need the simple approach first just to get started. And that, that helps you understand some of the physics that is associated with a flight. Okay, there are a few pages of algebra which you can look up in the support documents uh, enables you to extrapolate or extract, if you like, the time variable from the equations. And you get to the final form of the equation which can be integrated if you know the density. It's how your velocity changes with altitude as a function of density. And those other terms in there relate to the aerodynamic characteristics of your flight, drag coefficient, area and mass, and of course your angle you're flying at. We need to know density. Well, we do know density to a certain extent. There's the US standard atmosphere, changes every day, but 
we've got a rough idea about what it is. The problem with that is you can't get an analytical solution from a solution like the standard atmosphere. So we'll make an approximation to the atmosphere, which is an isothermal model, which actually gives us a very simple exponential dependency of density with altitude, which enables us to solve the equations. Approximately, but better than nothing. It really, it's just too useful an approximation to be able to ignore it. And the error can be indicated in this plot here. The blue, this nice straight blue line on a logarithmic plot is our approximation we're going to make. The, the red line is, of course, the real world. So you can see there are significant differences. Of course, we hide the differences a bit by making it a log plot, but it's still a very useful approximation. But whenever you use it, remember, it is an approximation, and check your numbers more carefully before you hop into your spacecraft and fly. OK, crunching the numbers a little bit, you get down to a nice solution, which is velocity against altitude, in terms of how fast you started with, what your flight angle is, and what your aerodynamic characteristics are. Very useful formulation. That, of course, can then now be analysed a bit further to work out what is your deceleration at any point in time, or point in altitude, so you can work out the stresses that you've got to design your vehicle to, to survive as well. And then you can find out where your maximum deceleration occurs. But very useful information that will be fairly, fairly well representative of what's going to happen in flight. Like, if you've been out in space, you want to get home in a hurry, so obviously the quickest way down is straight vertically down. So what happens if you do that? You put pi by 2, 90 degrees into your equations, and you'll see on that purple line there, you get a maximum acceleration of about 180 g. You won't, you won't survive, so self-evidently, you're not going to be coming straight down. What might be a more realistic angle to take? Well, it take this at 0.2 radians for this condition, where it's 8 kilometers per second re-entry, and I've, I've concocted some characteristics for a representative flight vehicle. Here it's a bit more reasonable. We're, we're coming in at around about 12 degrees and we're peaking out at about 35 g. Still a bit too much for humans, but, but some payloads will be required to sustain those sort of decelerations. So this is an example as to how you can control your trajectory compared uh, in the light of what, what are your objectives. Who are you carrying people? Are you carrying animals? Etc. Okay, that, that was talking about coming back from Earth. I'll now talk about a cruise corridor. This is something we'll want to do when we get scramjets working, because you don't want to just go into space. You want to keep traveling around the Earth, have a useful form of transport. Well, evidently, if you're going at cruise, that's constant speed, constant altitude. All your forces have to be matched. So lift and drag have to be, sorry, thrust and drag have to be matched. And also, the more important thing to determine where to fly is you need a certain centripetal force to keep going in a circle. That comes partly from gravity partly from the lift of your vehicle. So you can do a simple formulation to relate these, and, and that tells you where to fly for a given speed. Of course, now that you want a sustained cruise, drag is no longer an advantage, it's a disadvantage, so your vehicle shape has to change fundamentally. You want slender bodies that look a bit nicer. This is a DARPA Falcon HDV2 vehicle, which is an unmanned experimental hypersonic aircraft, which has flown recently. It's sharp, you can see it's sharp leading edges lead to high heat transfer. So a lot of disadvantages or problems, you might say, associated with the use of them. This is a, another lifting body. You need to get lift if you're going to cruise. This is a wave rider tested in our expansion tube X3 at UQ. They're, they're, they're long and slender. They look more like a traditional airplane, in fact. And even the space shuttle, when it comes close to touching down, it's flying again like a proper airplane and it's not got its 45 degrees angle of attack. OK, well, how do we work these things out? Very simple. Uh, mass is pulling down, lift is lifting you up, the difference between these makes you keep flying in a circle. It's convenient to reference these speeds to what you would have if you were in orbit. Like you go from the ground to orbit, you don't actually change your altitude very much, about 100 kilometers out of 6400 radius of the Earth, so we'll ignore for the purposes of this analysis any changes in g. Take g to be constant. So we know that the uh, that can define what our orbital speed is. It's just uh, g is v squared over r. So now we can write our equations, including a lower speed where you need to use your lift to hold you up there, and we will reference everything to your velocity you're flying with. That's the v and the velocity you would have in orbit. And uh, of course, the lift goes in a lift coefficient, an area, and your density, and your dynamic pressure. We can extract the density from this and to find out what density you need to fly at to cruise at a given velocity. Why do we want to know density? Well, once we've defined density, we can find out what altitude we have to fly at to get that density. 
And again, we need to reinvoke our atmospheric model for density. Okay, well, you can solve that equation and you get a simple expression for altitude. Uh, at this point in time, I haven't put in a value for density. If you substitute into this equation, uh, isothermal approximation for density, which gives us the exponential dependency, you can get this uh, expression for altitude as a function of velocity. Or you can do it the other way around to find what speed you need to fly at at a given altitude to, to cruise. Inspecting this equation, you could see m over a, that's mass per unit area, is an important parameter. We know that as a ballistic coefficient of a vehicle, how heavy you're going to load its wings. So on here I've plotted several ballistic coefficients to see how our flight corridor changes in, in respect as you change your vehicle characteristics. And you can see over the velocity range on the horizontal axis coming in from Earth orbit, you'll be a bit under 8 kilometers per second. That's where you're likely to be flying in a lifting body trajectory.